Welcome back to Book View Now and our coverage of the Miami Book Fair here in downtown Miami on this Sunday afternoon. I'm joined now by Mark Kurlansky, and his new book is Paper Paging Through History. Welcome. Thank you. I think one wants to begin by saying paper, but that's, you know, paper. It's like I thought paper was almost gone, but it's not. So, so did I. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that was part of my thinking about doing a book about paper, but it turns out not to be true at all. Um, I mean, I've talked to many, many people, not only in the paper business, but in the computer and electronics, and nobody thinks that paper is anywhere near its end. Um, it's actually doing quite well. Of course, you know, there's winners and losers. Some things are doing better than other things. Well, before we get to that, why, why did it interest you? I mean, what, what, why is it a great subject? Uh, what really got me about the subject was that... <clears throat> It's a way of looking at this kind of small thing in terms of technology of really coming to understand what the role of technology is, how technology acts in history and acts in society. And, and what I learned is, I, I call it the technological fallacy, the, the, the misconception that technology changes society. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't happen that way, and you can see that throughout the history of paper, that technology actually facilitates changes. Society decides on changes for all sorts of socioeconomic reasons, mm -hmm. and when they, there are changes they want, they turn to technology to facilitate those changes. So, give, so, so make that a little concrete. Give me an example. In the, in so, I mean, it was invented in, in, in China because the, the Chinese were doing a tremendous amount of, of writing and, and artwork, and they were doing it on uh, silk and on tortoise shells and, and carving on rocks and bamboo. Mm -hmm. and, and they just needed something better, something that was faster and cheaper and um, more practical. Yeah. And so they invented paper. And then um, they taught their culture to the Koreans and the Japanese, um, all of the uh, uses of writing, the, the, their incredible written language mm -hmm. and uh, uh, religion and accounting and all of these things for which they needed paper. So then these places also needed paper. Mm -hmm. um, and the Arabs, when the Arab world started, um, uh, you know, the Arab world in the Middle Ages was a, a tremendously literate society where people yeah. read and there was mathematics, and there was uh, fairly advanced accounting, and science, and, and poetry. And a lot of our classics comes through that period. Right? Yes. From and, the and Greeks through the Islamic Middle Ages. Right, so. and, and cookbooks. Yeah, <laughs> they yeah, did yeah. cookbooks. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, and in the meantime, so they made a lot of paper, and they, they tried to sell it to the Europeans. The Europeans weren't interested. Because European society, very few people read. Yeah. The few things that they did print, they, that they did write down, um, were in Latin. Yeah. Which, you know, we think now, oh, in those days, people used to read Latin. They didn't. Nobody understood Latin. <laughs> right. Well, it was and, for the scribes right. and the priests, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, they'd produce a book every year or so. Yeah. And uh, um, so they made them out of parchment, and that was fine. You know, you had to kill about 150 animals. Well, that's what I was thinking. I mean, papyrus and parchment, which we think of as the early uh, yeah. r things that were written, that, they, that's great stuff, but it's just not practical. I it's guess. great stuff if you're not producing that much. Yeah. You know, yeah. like the Vatican wanted to have the great library of Christendom, and they had about 500 books. Right. And there were libraries all over the Arab Empire that would have hundreds of thousands of books. Right. Right. If you're doing hundreds of thousands of books, you can't be doing them in parchment. You couldn't yeah. possibly slaughter enough animals. Yeah. So did paper spread from China to Japan? This, this quick history. Yes. How quickly was, how quick did it spread? Not very quickly, a thousand years. Yeah, okay. For it to get yeah. to Europe. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they, the paper was primarily made from uh, cloth. And the thing about paper, um, it's kind of a crazy idea um, that, you know, organic substances have fibers, are made of fibers, the yeah. fibers we call yeah. cellulose, although. It was a long time before anybody used that word or right. knew what it was. 
Uh, but you break things down to cellulose fibers. You mix these fibers with water in a very diluted way, so the water is almost clear. You pour it on a screen. It will just randomly interweave, and it will dry that way. You peel it off, and you have this sheet that you can write on. Yeah. I mean, it's just hard to imagine how anybody thought of doing that. Uh, Did you know much of this uh, background, or even had you thought about what paper actually is? <laughs> No, no, I, I really... Um, I mean, it's one of those things you know, that's great, sitting here so common and, you know, who even thinks about the, it, right? The, one of the things I love about what I do yeah. is that I just learn so much about completely different subjects. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and, how, and how do you do that research or how do you do that learning? Uh, I, first of all, do a lot of reading and library research yeah. and I interview lots of people. Yeah. Um, and wherever possible I go places. Because you really, there's really no substitute for seeing things. I, I always remember when I was working on my SALT book, yeah. I, um, I went to Tunisia and uh, I saw Carthage, the remains of Carthage that yeah. the Romans had destroyed. Yeah. And seeing that place and what the Romans had done, I got this understanding of Rome that I had never had. Right. You know, I mean, sometimes you just have to see it. Yeah. And so, I mean, it, I think that as I look at your books here, you, there is, because you have to travel, because paper travel, you get right. to travel, right? Right. <laughs> right. So, um, so, the, so, I mean, uh, cod, salt, paper, you, you, you have these, you love these uh, simple titles, right? <laughs> but the subjects are these kinds of things that we almost take for granted, or that are not usually the subject of big history. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, it's not, it's not exactly what I'm trying to do. I mean, what I'm trying to do is tell a good story and a story that teaches us something about who we are and how we got uh -huh. there. And it's true, a lot of these things seem like somewhat obscure topics, but I didn't think so. I thought they were really big and important. I mean, I think I, mm -hmm. maybe I'm just odd that way. You know, I mm -hmm. once met uh, Walter Cronkite. Mm -hmm. And uh, I interviewed him for my book on 1968. Went to his apartment on the east side of Manhattan, knocked on the door, and there he was, you know, this guy who had been giving me my news all my life. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and I'm sort of taking this in, and, and there he is with his Walter Cronkite voice. He says, Why, I know you. You're the leading expander of minutia. <laughs> Did you like, I mean, besides hearing him say it, I love hearing him say yeah, that. Yeah, but what about the description? I, it's, it's not no, exactly. No, I'm not, it's not minutia to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the um, you know, going back to thinking about the winners and losers in, in paper, I mean, you, you do go back, and one always inevitably goes back to like Plato and Socrates talking about when we start writing, it will be the end of yeah. thinking, right? I mean, yes. because who will ever have to think anymore? Well, that, I mean, that was wrong. I mean, people always... They always say that. Yeah, if you go back and, and, and read uh, Phaedra, Plato, talking about the written word yeah. and how, you know, the written word was going to, it was going to destroy memory. Right. Uh, it's Which was the, the key to knowledge, you know. Right. So and, it's and, really... And, and he yeah. said, you know, the people who just learn something by reading it don't have any true knowledge. Right. Which is what I think when, you know, I'm trying to have a conversation with somebody and they Google the answer. I think, oh, well, this is somebody who doesn't know anything. Well, that's, but that's what I was trying to get to. I mean, that, that kind of discussion has been going on a long time. Yeah. And you're documenting some of it through the actual physical thing, right, of paper. Right. But that intellectual discussion is still with us. Yes, yeah. And, and I think it's important to understand that at every turn, we go back to these same fears mm -hmm. about how we're going to lose our memory, we're going to lose our culture. Um, I don't believe any of this. Uh, I think that just like, you know, the written word, I mean, the written word did, it did change. And it probably did, in ways, reduce our memory. But the reason it reduced our memory is we didn't need as much mm -hmm. memory. I mean. Mm -hmm. The fact is that illiterate people have tremendous memories. But I don't hear anybody arguing that we should stay illiterate so that we can have really great memories. Right, right. Know? I mean, there's also in the digital age, I just recently went out to, I don't know if you're aware of this place in um, San Francisco, the Internet Archive, yeah. where they're kind of backing up the web. And 
I mean, the, the, the point being that digital information is far more fragile than most of us ever think. Yeah. Right? And so... Oh, I, I really feel that. It's yeah. like I never feel comfortable with... Um, uh, you know, I, I'm just constantly printing things out. Yeah. So that, you know, I'll, but I don't ha I'll think have most, them after but I don't the think, crash. I don't know if you have kids, but I don't think my kids think that. No, they do don't. You know? Yeah. They don't. My daughter, you know, she doesn't back up her phone. Right. It drives my wife crazy. She was saying, "When are you going to back up your phone?" <laughs> right, but she thinks if it's if it's if it's digital that, information, it lives forever. It's that's yeah. that's her reality. Yeah. yeah. To me, it's not real until you get it on paper. <laughs> <laughs> so paper lives on, huh? You 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 you. Um, I just want to ask you in our couple of minutes about your path to this. I know from journalism to start writing books as yeah. you were practicing journalism, and then at a certain point. You're, you're just you're writing books, right? Yeah. Is, that how it, is that how it developed? Well, you know, I started off as a playwright. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, okay. I, have a, I have a degree in theater. Oh. And I started off as a playwright. And I, um, I went into journalism because I just wasn't entirely comfortable in the theater world and uh -huh. wanted to feel more relevant and involved and all yeah. that. And, yeah. and, um, but I always had the idea that someday I would move out of newspapers into books. Um, I, I, I always wanted to do that yeah. because um, you were so limited. I mean, first book I did was called The Continent of Islands and it was about the Caribbean. Yeah. I had been covering the Caribbean for, I don't know, maybe 10 years for the Chicago Tribune. Mm -hmm. And what I did for this book... That statement itself is hard to imagine today, isn't it? Yes. That anybody for the Chicago Tribune is covering the Caribbean. Yeah, absolutely. That doesn't exist anymore. That, that, yeah. that, that uh, foreign desk is gone. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And it was great. Yeah. It was really great. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, um, the, the first thing I did when I did this book is I went back to so many stories that I had written about and did them in depth. You know, did all the stuff that I couldn't do for a newspaper. Yeah. I mean, to begin with, when you're writing for a newspaper, if you're foreign, you're, you, you know, you go to some place and you have to file the story by six, seven o'clock at night. Right. So it means that whatever story you take on has to be a story that will resolve itself by 4.30 to get back to your hotel to write it. So there's lots of stuff you just don't take on because uh, you'll never make your deadline on it. Right. Uh, so the newspapers, I mean, I love newspapers, but um, mm -hmm. there's like a whole world of stuff on any subject you can do that you can't do for newspapers. Yeah. And just in our last 30 seconds or so, because it's a book festival, you're clearly always reading for whatever book you're working on, but what do you read for pleasure? For pleasure, I read almost always fiction. Yeah. Novels and short stories. Like yeah. contemporary? And yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, any any last uh, any final recommendation you want to give us? Um, uh, you mean about books that I've been reading? Yeah. You know, it's funny. Whenever I ask that, I always go yeah, blank. I can't remember. I, just, I, I, just saying, I yeah, completely yeah. blank. But I, right. I I I love uh, short stories. I've written three collections of short yeah. stories, and yeah. it's a favorite form of reading and of writing for me. Okay. The new book is Paper Paging Through History. Mark Kurlansky. Thank you very much. Pleasure talking to you.